Okay. Well, so now we're fi finally at reinforcement learning. Uh, we have the last five lectures left for reinforcement learning, uh, as our TA ha uh, has emailed everyone. Uh, so for the last five lectures, we'll be reviewing reinforcement learning, you know, temporal uh, difference learning, and um, you know, actor critic, you know, function approximation, and finally, uh, reinforce uh, deep reinforcement learning. Um, so, you know, I'm still working on giving you the feedback for your progress report. So, you know, stay tuned. I might need another uh, a day or two um, to get back to everyone. Um, so, in terms of the final presentation, um, so originally we plan to have. Uh, synchronous sessions. Uh, after a detailed discussion with you know other TAs, we've decided we do we'll we'll do it asynchronously. So people have the last two lectures off and use the time to get ready and prepare for the slides. So everyone has 12 minutes and you know we will give you feedback uh, right after the deadline of submitting these presentation uh, movies. So I hope this is very much like a mini conference where um, you know everyone have a presentation to do. So hopefully um, you know you should also be supportive of your peers and try to ask questions and watch others' videos. Um, you know if something seems to be very interesting to you. Okay, so today we're um, this is the introduction to reinforcement learning. I'll be talking about a few basic concepts. So I will not talk about a lot of like, you know, hand baby, um, you know, conceptual um, kind of explanations. Hopefully I'll give you some intuitive explanations, but I wanted to make this as concrete as possible. So, you know, you can see I've already shared the slides for the last five lectures. Um, so, you know, feel free to uh, take a look at them before the class. Um, also, you know, the um, chapter 14 of the Foundations of Machine Learning book, as well as Southern Barlow's Reinforcement Learning and Introduction book. So take a look at those books and, you know, you will find them really helpful. Okay, so before we start, let me see if there's any question in the audience. All right, so let's move on. Um, also, I figured out a way to use a laser pointer. So hopefully this is helpful. Okay, so I'll give you an outline, you know, first of all, for six topics we will be covering. Of course, today we'll do introduction of reinforcement learning. And, you know, we will talk about Bellman equations. So, you know, the key concept for reinforcement learning. Um, we will then talk about temporal difference methods, right? So this is a fundamental algorithm that is used in a lot of algorithms in, you know, deep reinforcement or later more advanced reinforcement learning algorithms. So I wanted to emphasize that. Um, and I wanted to spend some time, you know, explain that clearly. Then, you know, of course, everyone knows that you know, in order to uh, get us ready for understanding deep reinforcement learning, we wanted to learn function approximations. I'll learn function approximations. Oh, we'll talk about function approximations for value functions as well as policy functions. Okay. So later we'll talk about a meta algorithm in reinforcement learning, which is actor critic methods. So I call it meta algorithm. When we talk about it, you guys will see why it is a meta algorithm. It is actually a framework that can have many modulars and you can use whatever modular you like in this actor critic kind of framework. Okay. So lastly, um, we hope to cover some deep reinforcement learning. And you know, just like many of you, I'm still learning the deep reinforcement learning myself. So I've been trying to, you know, provide as much as I can. Um, and I hope that the last session is a 
kind of brainstorming discussion, right? ML ourselves. So I promised to have more discussions during the class, but it turns out um, probably just the inconvenience of like, you know, teaching online. Um, I don't think we have a lot of opportunities to discuss, but hopefully the last lecture, the different enforcement learning, I hope everyone can be, you know, speak up a little bit and try to um, have some kind of discussion going on. Okay. Um, so let's get started. First topic, introduction. So this is, you know, the probably the very high level introduction of our reinforcement learning. I want to start with the other two frameworks that we're more familiar with. You know, we started learning machine learning from a supervised learning perspective. Maybe the first algorithm you guys learn about is a classification algorithm with some training data and the data has some labels, right? So you basically, for a supervised learning task, you will learn from a training set of labeled examples. And usually people make assumptions about the IID of these examples. Okay, all of these examples can be high dimensional. You know, there are some relationship across the attributes, but across the data points, you always assume, not always, I guess, usually most of the time assume um, the data points are IID. So that's the supervised learning. Well, after we learned supervised learning, then we started to learn unsupervised learning. And I kind of alluded, you know, before, I guess a few lectures before, said that unsupervised learning is really doing density estimation. So this is why I said estimate density function, right? So a lot of that is uh, dedicated to finding hidden structure in data. And indeed, our um, lectures on learning latent variable models is a very good example of some guaranteed methods for doing unsupervised learning. Of course, in a lot of scenarios, people think about unsupervised learning and they think about MLE, maximum likelihood estimator. Um, I think that's a very popular method, but in this lecture, we kind of give you an alternative for doing unsupervised learning. Right, not directly using maximal likelihood estimator or not directly using likelihood, but use some spectral method and do some moment matching. Okay. So lastly, this is you know the introduction of today's lecture. So after we learn supervised and unsupervised learning, we we'll learn the reinforcement learning. It's a more complicated learning scenario because you learn from interactions and not from examples. And more importantly, there is this environment that you can affect. So you can take actions that will even eventually affect the environment that you're learning from. So that's why we say is learning from interactions, not from examples, right? So learning from examples basically are like, there is an environment, you are generating examples from that environment and, you know, Hypothetically, you can think about these examples are already generated when you're learning. So you won't affect any of these environments, no matter what, as a learning agent. However, in reinforcement learning, you know, you are generating examples or you are accumulating experience as you learn, right? So the goal is to maximize some kind of accumulated rewards. So this is the online process, right? So there are many time steps involved in your learning process. And you don't only care about the reward for each step. You know, we will see what those rewards are, but you know, you essentially care about maximizing some kind of accumulated rewards. So also, you know, different from unsupervised learning, you're not finding hidden structures, trying to find a maximal accumulated rewards through some actions. Okay, and that actions essentially becomes a policy, but we can get back, uh, we can get to that. So let's see if there is any questions. This is a very, very high level recap of the uh, reinforcement learning.
Oh, yeah. So Cal has a uh, link here um, on the chat. So it's linking a good blog post about reinforcement learning. Um, so yeah, feel free to, thank you for posting this. Feel free to take a look at that. Okay, so there is no more question, I'll proceed. Okay, so what is learning from interactions, right? We said reinforcement learning is learning from interactions. What is really that? So learn from what you do. So you would basically learn actions to maximize accumulated numerical rewards. So the agent basically is not told what to do, but is trying to discover the best behavior. And the action that it takes affect future outcome. So whatever you're doing right now, you have to make a prediction about what is the long-term effect of this action uh, as a learner you're taking, okay? So in practice, uh, you know, although conceptually, this seems to be a well-defined problem, but in practice, learning from interactions could be very uh, complicated, right? For example, um, you know, you, you are observing something in a very, uh, you know, complex environment, you know, the problems are usually you have like continuous and high dimensional state, and even your action could be continuous and high dimensional. Um, and usually the reason, you know, of this, due to these complexity, usually you would only come up with some kind of approximate solution uh, for, for, for these kind of problems. Okay, so in practice, there are a lot of more challenges, but in today's lecture, and probably in the first few lectures, uh, first, le let's say three lectures um, of the reinforcement learning in this course, we will be not considering about very complicated scenarios. We will consider a tabular case, uh, which you know uh, means that you would have finite number of states and finite number of actions, and you usually assume that they're pretty small, but so, you know, I haven't really formally introduced state and actions yet, but let's, let's see that in the next slide. So um, in reinforcement learning, there is this very famous dilemma, which is the exploration and exploitation dilemma. What does this dilemma say? It says that in reinforcement learning, a goal-seeking agent must simultaneously do the following, exploit current knowledge, but also explore new actions. So you can see this seems to be contradicting to each other. However, from a long-term point of view, they are helping each other, right? So exploiting current knowledge, how can you do that? Unless you know the environment very well, then you can exploit your knowledge by taking some very good actions that would incur some good rewards. Whereas, you know, exploring new actions. Uh, so, you know, so, but, you know, in order to have these, in order to have a good knowledge of the environment, you have to explore new actions, right? If you don't explore what's unknown, you are unlikely to get a good knowledge of the environment. So that's why you have to explore new actions. But the problem with exploring new actions is that you know, by exploring these new actions, you might get very bad rewards for these new actions. You know, since we said the, the goal of the reinforcement learning is to maximize the accumulated rewards. So exploring new actions could in some short term um, hurt the performance, right? So that's the kind of exploration exploitation dilemma. Um, and you know, in reinforcement learning, it's really a kind of subtle trade-off between the two in a lot of scenarios. Okay, so that is a very, again, a very high level about the exploration exploitation dilemma. But more importantly, I wanted to um, introduce reinforcement learning using some kind of abstraction. So I would say reinforcement learning offers an abstraction to the problem of goal-directed learning from iteration. Okay, so that's you know, the theme sentence here. And 
essentially reinforcement learning proposes that, you know, the kind of uh, sensory memory and control uh, kind of apparatus and the objective can be reduced to state, uh, states, actions, and rewards passing back and forth between the agent and the environment. Okay, so we'll see a picture here. Oh, something is, okay. I Somehow my slides are not rendering correctly, but please look at this here first. So this is the picture. Everyone might have seen this before, right? So I still wanted to spend a little bit of time in explaining this picture here, right? So you have the environment here, right? Um, you know, with this environment, you're getting some kind of, you, you also have an agent, okay? So the agent wanted to take an action. So it's at time T, the agent is taking an action AT, right? The action has to be taken on this environment. And then, you know, because I take this action AT, the environment would give me some kind of feedback what is the feedback? The feedback is what kind of state I will be transitioned to. So this is S T plus one. You know, before when I was at time T, I was at state S T. But now after the action, I'm at S T plus one. And also another feedback I'm getting is an immediate reward here. So it is capital R subscript um, T plus one. Is there anything in the chat that I need to clarify or that's good? Okay, seems like, seems fine, okay. So this figure is showing this kind of agent environment interface, right? So what's more important is from this figure, we are abstracting things. So we're abstracting all the you know variables that are related to the state is like state space so you have a state space in this example let's just say that it's a finite state space so you enumerate all the states as s superscript one all the way to s superscript cardinality of the state space okay so also you have the action space so the action space, you can also list it this way. And you have the reward space. Usually you wanted to consider the reward space as something bounded, right? Like from zero to one or something like that, or from zero to R max, right? Um, and then, you know, very interestingly, you wanted to denote the history. So what is HT? HT is just the history of the agent behavior. So is from time t zero. So from time zero to time t, you know what is the what is the history? The history is that at time zero, I start with a state s zero. I take an action, right? I started with this s zero. I take an action a zero, and then I get a reward r one. But I also transit to another state s one. Right, and then so on. I can do that for t times. And therefore, um, as time t, this trajectory is my history. Okay, so is a uh, triple, is a triple of s a r uh, from time zero to time t. Okay, so there is a very interesting notational kind of uh, issue here. So. We often call the S0 and A0 um, renders like R1. So, you know, if you are at time T, then you're at state ST. So the action that you're taking, you often is called AT, and then you're getting a reward that is called RT plus one, not RT, right? So that's just the convention that we're following. But of course, you can have your own convention. Usually we would call, you know, we would follow this convention of this reward being RT plus one, not RT. Okay. Okay, so once we learned this history, 
then there is this transition model. So this is the, the so-called transition model in reinforcement learning literature, literature. So what is it? It's just the conditional probability of under such a history. So you, know, you can see this condition on this HT. What is the probability of uh, the joint distribution of ST plus one and RT plus one? Okay. So this is the transition model, right? So you can see HT start from S0, you know, has this entire trajectory until ST, right? So you have, have, transit, have transited from S0 to S1 all the way to ST. And now I'm also taking action AT. So this is my history. Under this history, you will see, you know, the joint probability of my next state and the reward I'm getting. Right. This is the transition model. You can see when I say a transition model, I do not only mean the transition of the state, but I also mean the transition of the reward because both the state and the reward will be, um, you know, will be different, right? After this taking of the action. And, you know, we, we often, you know, the convention is that we call this joint probability transition model. Okay, so that's that. Now, so that under the transition model, people often make such an assumption of Markov, Markovianity. So it's like Markov property of the transition model, or like you know, usually people make such Markov property assumption. So what does that mean? It means just that S T plus one only depends on S T and A T. Okay. Similarly, also. The RT plus one only depends on ST and AT. So you can see for this entire history, I not only have ST and AT, but I also have something in the history, you know, from, from time zero to time T minus one, right? So I, you know, all these do not affect my transition. So the Markov probably just that it only depends on the previous time. So it's previous state ST. And of course, the action that I'm taking at that state. So it only depends on ST and AT. So therefore, under Markov property, the transition model, which is on the left-hand side of this equation, is equivalent to this simplified uh, probability, conditional probability, right? So you know now the HT has become ST and AT due to this dependence on ST and AT only. Okay, so by the way, don't look at this yet. Um, I, I wanted to show you this figure here first. So this figure is showing this Markov property, okay? So you have S1, you started with S1. Of course, you also have S0, not here, I'm just showing S1 here. So with S1, so you're going to take an action. This action will be actually some kind of uh, policy. We haven't talked about policy yet, but so just ignore that for a second. Take based on some policy you're taking an action and this action only, so you know the policy only depends on the current state. You can see it's a function uh, that's conditioned on the ST, right? So in this case is S1. So you take an action, right? And then this transition will give you, you know, based on this transition model, you will transit to S2, but of course you also would have a reward. I'm just ignoring the reward in this figure here. So, and then, you know, you take another action A2 and only from A2 and S2, you will completely decide which state you are transit to. Of course, this transition is a realization from a stochastic model, right? Because we, the transition model is only a probability, right? It is not a deterministic model. So you just sample from the probability and that's gonna be like one transition. And that's why in reinforcement learning, if you have stochastic model, then you would potentially need more, um, you know, samples to more, com you know, confidently estimate the quantities. So due to the stochasticity of these transition model. Okay. Um, Oh, that's a very good question. So once we have AT and ST, 
don't we know RT plus one? We don't because that's the reward model. That is a underlying reward model, right? So we have to learn that. You know, so you would want to ask the same question. Once we have AT and ST, don't we know ST plus one already? Or that's the same thing. Do you see um, the point here? Okay, wonderful. All right, so, so that's the transition model. I just wanted to emphasize that this is a stochastic model here. Of course, the deterministic model is just the special case of the stochastic model, right? Uh, where you, know, you are transitioning to something with probability one. So that's a deterministic model, but it's just a special case of the stochastic model. So now, what, you know, I hope this part is clear. Now let's move on to this part, right? So I wanted to first emphasize that the expected reward of taking action A at a state is also called a expected uh, reward model, right? So what is that? It's just saying the expectation of the reward giving the state and the action, right? This again, you know, goes back to um, Ahilash's question, sorry, I might have pronounced your name incorrectly. Um, your question of like, you know, whether we've already know RT plus one given uh, AT and ST. So as a learner, you don't know, but of course, when you have observed a lot of samples that are transitioning from ST, you know, taking action AT at ST, then you would, you know, more and more confidently know what the reward model might be, right? You would have an empirical estimation of the reward model. So, so this, however, now we're still talking about the transitioning model. So this is called the expected uh, reward model, right? So it is, you can see it's very obvious. It can be written in this form due to the, you know, definition of the conditional expectation. And now for a simple notation, you know, we sometimes write this transition probability as something like P of S prime R, uh, you know, conditional S A. So this is the shorthand notation just for simplicity of the notation. Um, so, you know, I want to make sure that everyone um, remember this notation so you don't get confused later on when I have something like this, okay? And also when you read reinforcement learning papers, I remember when I was reading reinforcement learning papers a few years ago, I was very confused about their notations because many of the papers use shorthand notations. Um, but you know, once you are more familiar with the conventions, um, it will be much easier to understand the notations. This is one of them that they use a lot using this shorthand notation for this transition model. Okay, I hope there's no more questions here. Or if there is, feel free to speak up. Okay, so from this transition model, right, we can also get the state transition probability. So this is by marginalizing out this R, you can get a state transition probability, right? So this is a joint probability condition on SA. Now it is a state transition probability. And you could also, like I said, earlier, you can get an expected reward, uh, which can be written in this form here. Right? This is very similar to what I have here as well. Okay. Okay, so this slide is again, very basic introduction about the notations of reinforcement learning and um, so essentially, you know, this interaction between the agent and the environment, right? So we care a lot about the transition model. I guess that's the takeaway message. And the transition model is the joint probability conditions on S and A. Usually we would assume Markov property. So throughout the entire lecture, we would always assume Markov property. Um, so, you know, you can marginalize out that, you know, joint conditional probability to get state transition probability and the expected reward. Okay. So now I guess this is the most important 
concept in reinforcement learning as a starting point, the value function, right? This is really related to the accumulated rewards that I was talking about earlier about the goal of reinforcement learning. So, you know, for this value function before that, we wanted to introduce this policy. So now we're in the Markov property regime. So the policy was always looking at the current state only, right? So if you're looking at current state ST, then, you know, your policy is gonna be a function depends on ST. So it could be a distribution over the entire state space, right? Imagine that you have a such state, um, sorry, action space, I meant to say, sorry, is a distribution of action space. So imagine under state ST, you have a such candidate actions, right? Then, you know, your policy could be a distribution over these candidate actions. And then you sample from that distribution every time when you are encountering ST, okay? So of course, if you have a policy, you can imagine you can have a probability of 80 um, conditional ST and probability of 80 condition, uh, sorry, AT plus one condition S to plus one or uh, AT condition or ST, right? Um, so essentially you could also write it as something like pi of AT condition of ST. The reason why I'm writing this is because I wanted to show you that usually policy is stationary, meaning like, you know, the policy that I'm making now is the same as the policy I'm making uh, at the next time. Right, so we're at another time. Um, of course, you don't have to assume stationary policy, right? You could change your policy whenever you can, but here, usually when I say if it's the same policy, it just means that it is stationary over time, okay? So I wanted to ask you a question. Let's say I have A states and S, uh, sorry, let's say I have S states and A actions in my environment. So what would this pi AT conditional ST be? If I collect all these uh, probabilities, would it be a matrix? Would, be, would it be a tensor? Would it be a uh, you know, vector? What would it be? So once again, you know, I'm in a tabular case, I have S states and I have A action. So how would this be? Okay, first of all, I wanted to ask you, what is the dimensionality of this guy? Yes. So, you know, it would be something like RA, right? Because it's, it's going to be a simplex with A such elements, right? It's a distribution over all the candidate actions. Of course, we're in a tabular case. We know there are like just A such actions, capital A such actions. So it's going to be this vector. But now I have ST within this S1. Right? So therefore I have, let me not use cardinality here, not to confuse you, just S. <laughs> this is a little bit abuse of notation. So I have S such states. So I would have S such vectors, right? So if I stack them, then it becomes a matrix. Right, so A by S matrix. Or of course, you can also just, you know, align them as a vector. So it's gonna be A times S vector, but usually people think of it as a tabular case. Basically it means that, you know, the state action uh, thing is like, you, know, you think of it as a matrix. Okay. Okay, awesome. So now that's the policy. Now let's talk about the return, okay? Um, how should I erase this? Oh, okay. Um, there is no eraser, but that's fine. Okay, so for the state, oh, uh, sorry, for the return, um, you know, this is the new terminology here. So return also means accumulated 
future rewards. Um, so it has a hyperparameter gamma, which is the discount factor. So what does this discount factor mean? It means that I value my current, my most immediate return more than the return in the future. And this makes a lot of sense, right? So, you know, something that in the very long future might not matter much to me than something that is, you know, now. So there is this gamma is just some kind of discounting factor. And how does it discount? Usually gamma is smaller than one and greater than zero. So it would just make every future to be a little bit less important, right? So if there's more future in the, um, is, is further in the future, then it is more discounted. And, you know, so the K is like uh, some kind of, um, indicator of how far away you are in the future, right? So of course, when K is zero, it just means this is our T plus one. So it's the most immediate reward right now. Okay. And here where we have a capital T just to say that this is the horizon. So our time cannot go greater than capital T, but of course, you can imagine it can go to a very large number, essentially infinity, right? Okay, so this is the discount factor and this rewards are like summing over all the rewards in the future. So this is so-called accumulated future rewards. Of course, this gamma is a hyperparameter that you can select based on your needs. And also it's called a return. Okay, so now it's the return. So now we're ready to introduce this value function. So value function, it actually means two different things. One is the state value function. The other is the state action value function. Okay, so these are highly related, but also different. So state value function is called V of S and with a superscript pi. So this means that the state value function itself, you know, let's say if you write something like V of S, Oh, what's going on? If you write something V of S, it doesn't make any sense because I don't know what you mean by a value of a state unless you tell me what policy you will be following, okay? So the value is really some kind of accumulated reward in expectation if you are taking some policy. Right, so you know, along all the future, if you're taking policy pi, then I can compute what is my expected reward, right? So I cannot compute anything about the value if you don't tell me what is the policy. So very importantly, I wanted to emphasize that when you're writing your paper, don't forget this pi here. Um, is there, okay. Yeah, don't forget this pi here. Right, because it's very, very important. If you don't have the pi, it doesn't mean anything, right? Think about that. So the definition of the V superscript pi of S, it just means that under state S, right? So this is my current time. Let's say I'm now at time T and my S T is just S. S is a specific value in my candidate of my states, right? So under this scenario, what is my value or what is the return in expectation or what is the expected, expected accumulated future reward? So that's why it's called expectation under pi, right? This is very important. Expectation under pi of the RT condition them as T equals to S. So you can imagine if you don't have pi, you won't be able to know the expectation of the RT plus one, you know, under ST because you don't know which action you are taking, right? So if you are doing expectation over pi, then you know I'm taking action according to this distribution, which is denoted by pi, right? And therefore you can calculate the accumulated reward or expected accumulated reward, which is now the state value function for a policy pi. Okay, so now I hope this is clear, right? This is the value function definition. 
Now we're looking at the second definition, which is the state action value function. So you can see um, before this is the state value, but this is the state action value, right? Now you have the action. What does that mean? It means something really similar. It's also some kind of expected accumulated reward or expected return. But now you have this co additional condition, condition on A. So it means that you're now taking this specific action at time T. Okay, so AT is A, right? So not only that you're now looking at, you know, at current time you're at state S, but also taking action for this time T. But in the future, you're not taking anything else but according to pi, right? So from T plus one all the way to capital T, you will be taking this pi policy, right? Your actions will be following this pi policy. But at time t, you are not following pi. You're only doing this a here. Is this clear? So you can see the difference here, right? The difference is only the action that you're taking at t. For value function, for state value function, the action that you're taking at t is still following pi, whereas the state action value function, the action you're taking is just a. Doesn't follow any dis, uh, follow any policy, right? But in the future, it will, it will follow pi, and that's why you're taking expectation over pi. Is this clear? And, and this is very important, right? The first, especially, you know, for those of you who are, haven't worked in reinforcement learning and, you know, you wanted to get a quick understanding of these value functions. I hope this is a good explanation. Um, and also very importantly, I wanted to mention this quantity here and I, I kind of put it in a red and put it in a box. So the value, the state value function V pi of S can be written in this way, you know, purely because of the definition, right? Because, you know, as I said, the state action value function is not taking the action at time t, but it's taking the pi in the future. Now, let's imagine that if I look at, you know, the expectation of like the A following the policy pi, then it would exactly be the state value function, right? So that's what this equation is saying. Okay, so this is just saying, you know, the return, the expected return in the future is denoted by this Q pi of S A, right? Taking action A. But now my action A is taken according to my pi. See? So that's why my state value function becomes this term here. So there is this relationship between my state value function and my state action value function. <clears throat> okay. So now, you know, this is probably the most important message I wanted to show in the introduction, right? Of course, you know, the, it, it's very important to show you, you know, how reinforcement learning is an abstraction of a learning process that has interactions and how it is different from supervised and unsupervised learning. But this value function is really the key and it will be very, very important for all our future uh, discussions. So, you know, the most important example is, you know, so, so the most immediate example is the Spellman equation. It's essentially an equation on the value functions. So we'll see. Of course, like I said, throughout the entire lecture, it is, we're assuming Markov property. So here is the Bellman equation. Um, so, you know, actually it's down here. This is the Bellman equation, but I wanted to have this analysis here. So this part here, you can see what I'm you know, circling, right? So this part is some kind of derivation for us to understand why we have such a Bellman equation. And I wanted to go through it 
uh, step by step here because it's very important. And understanding this slide will help us understanding the future slides. Okay. So first of all, based on the definition of the value, a state value function, <clears throat> based on the definition of the state value function, we have this term, right? So, you know, this is, this equal, this equality is just this, you know, definition, right? RT is just the return and you're taking expectation over the policy, right? For all the future. Now you're at state as, you know, you're, so the state at time t is just s here. By the way, I wanted to emphasize, this is a random variable, right? S t, s sub t is a random variable and s is a value, is a state, right? It's a candidate state. So I'm just making the assumption that at time t, my state is s. So this is, I hope this doesn't confuse people here, okay? So now, you know, this is the expectation of the returns condition on the time t and at state s. And just by writing out, you know, because of the um, discounting, right? The definition of the RT is just the return, right? It's just RT plus one, like the most immediate reward plus a return in the future, right? Of course, the return in the future have to be discounted. Right, you can see this recursion here, right? So, oh. Yeah, so you can see this recursion here, right? So you have RT equals to gamma, oh, sorry. So ca capital RT equals to small RT plus one plus gamma of capital RT plus one, right? Also capital RT plus one, it's gonna be a small RT plus two uh, plus gamma of this thing, right? And if you substitute here into this equation, then you can see. Okay, and you can do that for many times. So it's, I hope this is clear, right? This is pretty obvious, okay? All right, so now, most importantly, I wanted to separate this into two parts, A and B. So A is the first part, which is my immediate reward, like, you know, right now. And then the B is my future, my, my expected accumulated reward in the future. Right? Of course, it has to be discounted by gamma once. Right? So that's gamma to the power of one. Now let's look at A here. So as I said before, right, this expectation can be written because you know, due to its definition in this way. But also, if you consider writing this as a joint distribution, like the transition model, as I said before, the transition model is the joint distribution between, you know, um, the reward and the S. So then it can be written in this way, but of course you can even add in the A here. So then it becomes the joint probability of the R, A and S prime. Okay? Um, again, I'm using a shorthand notation here. Why? You know, because otherwise it would be very long. It would be like, you know, RT plus one equals to R, comma uh, at you know uh, equals to a and st plus one equals to s prime condition of st equals to s it's going to be very long right so whenever i write it this way it's just a shorthand notation right so this you could assume this subscript for a is t subscript for t, r is t plus one subscript for s prime is t plus one and subscript for s is t so you do that, this is nothing but, you know, simple math here. So now you, you can see, I can write it in this way, right? This is very important from this step to this step is very important. You know, why? Because of this is how your, you know, model works, right? So how do you get the joint probability of this guy? It can be factorized into the joint probability of S prime R conditional on S A 
and the probability of A conditional on S. Can someone tell me why? This is nothing but, what is the name of this, guys? Well, it's very simple. Um, so, yeah, exactly, right? There's just, you know, I don't want people to fall asleep, you know, think, think of, oh, ask simple questions to keep you awake. Um, so yeah, this was nothing but Bayer's rule. Um, and then you can see because, you know, this, you know, the, the, this summation over S prime and A can be, again, written in this way because pi of A conditional S does not depend on S prime. So I can just take it out of the summation over S prime. So it becomes this equation here, right? Right, of course, again, I can just switch the order of A and R. Why? Because, you know, the summation of R, this part doesn't depend on R, R and this part doesn't depend on A. So I can just switch order for this two, right? And then I can have this form, right? So just keep it here for now. And now let's look at B, right? So the B is the future. The B is the expected re return in a future condition on the current state S. So what is it? Um, you know, you can see, first of all, I can, again, just do this kind of, uh, uh, so this is, again, just the Bayer's rule, right? So you can see the expectation of this guy conditional ST can be written as this guy conditional ST plus one. Be why do I do that? Because my RT plus one really just depends on ST plus one, right? Not ST because it's the future. So it depends on as, uh, T plus one state, not T state, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why we kind of wanted to do it this way. But of course you don't know what is the next state and that's why you have to do this summation over uh, this condition of probability multiplied with the probability of S prime condition on S, right? Hope this is clear. If no, you can uh, just type in the chat or just ask me, okay? All right, so now very interesting, you will see what is the definition, what is this guy? Based on definition of the uh, value. It's nothing but this one, right? V pi S prime, right? So the value function at state S prime, right? And then, you know, the rest will be written as this one. Okay. Right. So if you consider marginalizing out this joint probability will become this marginal probability condition on the ST. Okay. So again, um, because this can be written, so this is very similar to what we have seen before. This can be written using base rule as this, this one again, right? So, now you just switch order because this, you know, this part doesn't depend on A. So you can just take summation of A here at the uh, outside loop and then the R summing over R and summing over S prime. So you can see these two, right? So there are a lot of, uh, you know, similarities. So first of all, this part is similar and the summation of R is similar. Summation of S prime is similar, but the only difference, or, or even the transition, right? The transition of probability S prime R conditional S A is also similar. The only difference is one here, this is the R, this is the reward, right? The candidate reward, because you have to sum over all the candidate reward. Whereas here, 
this is not related to the current reward, but related to the value in the future under the next state as prime. Okay, so I'll pause for a second and see if there is any question. Okay, so after all, if you look at A and B, then you can see very clearly why we have such a Bellman equation, right? So this B is trying to relate the accumulator reward in the future as something like a value function in the next state. Whereas the part A is looking at the current step, okay? So it's just simply calculating out this expectation using the current step. And this one is simply relating it with the future value, state value function in the next state as prime. So overall, you can write it out as this one. So you know this part is just summation over A and B, this here, right? Of course, I, I didn't put the gamma here. So B have to be multiplied with gamma and that's why you have a gamma right here. Okay, so that is, you know, the definite. So I guess from a intuitive, like the explanation point of view, the only equation is really something that is a kind of recursion, you know, between, so let's see, so what is it, right? So this V pi S is the state value at state S, whereas V pi S prime is the state value at S prime. So it's like value at two different states. So how do you find a relationship between the value of, of two different states? using some kind of transition, right? So this transition is kind of relating those two, but also, you know, because this is a online process, right? You have different iteration. So these two can be related only through some kind of discounting, right? And some kind of, you know, discounting of the future and the, some kind of expectation over the um, over now, right? I hope this is like a intuitive explanation about the Bellman equation. Um, and now, so if there is no more questions, I'll just proceed to this one. So because we can write, so this is just a rewriting of the Bellman equation here. So we said, you know, this one we've already proved in the previous slide, right? So, you know, with this uh, policy and with this transition, uh, you have the current reward and the future discounted uh, value. So, you know, if you write it in this way, right? Because you can, real, you can see that this part does not really depend on S prime. So uh, you can just, you know, marginalize out this joint probability here and multiply it with R. So it becomes this part here. But, you know, this part doesn't depend on R. So you can again marginalizing out this joint probability and get like this probability, uh, you know, probability of S prime conditional S A and multiply it with this V pi, right? This is nothing but very simple uh, marginalization of the joint probabilities. So very interesting, you'll see, this is just a expected reward in current step, right? But of course, since you don't know what action you're taking, you have to do the multiplication with the pi A given S, you know, at time. So right now you only know you're at state S, you don't know what action you're taking, but you know that you're 
you know, following policy pi. So that's why you have pi a conditional s multiplied with this conditional expectation, okay? And now this part is, you know, it's like, you know, in the near, in the future, you know that you have a value function, but you don't know what state you will be transitioned to because you only know that your current state is s, but you don't know the next state. So this is showing you under this probability, you know, this is showing you so your expectation of so is also accounting for the probability of your transitioning to a next state, right? So, you know, this is probability of transitioning to x prime, but you're summing over all possible x primes. So hopefully this is an even easier interpretation of the Bellman equation here. Can see, right? This is the immediate uh, expectation of the reward, and this is the future, but under some transition to another state. Okay, so now you know because we know this part, we know this equation, right? We know this equation. Therefore, it's very easy to see that the Q of pi S A is just this part. Why? Because, you know, I already know which action I'm taking. So this is effectively like, you know, for these probabilities, I, you know, only one of them is one, the other is zero, and the one is just this A here. So that's why you don't have the summation here but you only have this term, but this term is conditional on this A here. Does that make sense? All right, this is very important, All right? So this Q pi of S A is just this part, All right? Because you already, you don't have to follow pi for this step. You already know it is just A. So only for A, it's gonna be one. For all the others, it's gonna be zero. That's, that's why you don't have the summation that you only have this for the A, okay? So once you have that, every, again, you can see it's just this part here, right? This is just what we've derived. And you can see now this, you know, state action value function is just summation of the expected reward at current time and the transitioning to another state and the value function for that state as prime. Okay, so maybe this is easier to understand first, right? But now this is just the value function written as the summation of this Q function here. Okay, so this slide is again Bellman equation, but a different form of the Bellman equation for the V function and for the Q function. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna move on to talk about optimal value function. So the optimal value function is a little bit different from, in, in essentially just a, you know, value function, but it's for the optimal policy. So it's basically denote, you can denote it as V star of S is just the maximum pi of the value function, right? So this is the highest value you can achieve. You will follow some kind of pi, okay? So that's why it's the maximum of expected return under state S. And similarly for the Q optimal value function, is also the maximum of Q pi S A, right? So, and that's that, just the, by, by definition, it's just that. So, you know, because we've already talked about different forms of, different forms of Bellman equation for a policy pi, so it also applies for this optimal policy. So you can see one difference here, right? So before, so just for, you know, comparison, before you have this, summation over pi a given s, 
But now you can see here, you don't have that. You only have a maximum of A because we know that the optimal value function would only take A. It would be deterministic, basically. Do you see this point? Can you, can you see why? Right. So before it would have this, you know, summing over a pi, a given s thing here, but now it doesn't. Why? Right? Because we know that for MDP, the optimal value function would just take a deterministic action. So that's why it's just the maximum of a for this guy. Okay. So this is very interesting here. So also for the Q, for the you know optimal Q function. So you can take a look at the previous Q function. You can see this is the form of the Q Bellman equation. But now if you look at here, so what's the difference? Can you see? Okay, so look at maybe you can look at this equation here. What's the difference? The difference is only that now it becomes a maximum of a prime q star of s prime a prime, right? Also because you know that in the future you would always take the action that maximize the q function. So that's why the Bellman equation has this very nice form for optimal um, value function. You know, here is the maximum here and also. So is this clear? Okay, thanks. Okay, so now finally, uh, I wanted to, so this is probably my last two slides. So, this, so I wanted to talk about the RRL diagram. Um, so one thing, you know, so when you guys maybe have heard about using dynamic programming for solving RL, if you know the dynamics, so this is dynamics just means the transition dynamics. If you know the joint probability of R prime and S prime condition on S A, then you can just use dynamic programming to learn reinforcement learning, right? So. One thing you can do is, for example, you can do value iteration, right? Or you can do like policy iteration, which is involving like policy evaluation and policy improvement. In policy evaluation, what you do is, you know, for a policy pi, you wanted to evaluate this function value here. <clears throat> value function here, sorry. <laughs> and then for the policy improvement, you want to find the policy that would, you know, take the action that maximize this Q function. Okay, so this is so-called the policy iteration, but also you have the value iteration. But nonetheless, the most important thing I wanted to say is that if you know the transition dynamics, which is unrealistic because you don't know in practice, right? But if you know, then you can just use dynamic programming to solve that. So now, you know, under the more realistic scenario of you don't know transition dynamics, what would you do, right? The most obvious way you wanted to do it is to do Monte Carlo prediction, right? You can just simulate the V function, right? The value function uh, for all state. Of course, now you're in a tabular case, you only have a small number of states. So you can just simulate the value function for all the states, right? So, you know, let's say you have some kind of value function is bounded between zero and T, right? Because your reward is always bounded by one and you only have T iterations. So then you can use some kind of inequality such as Hopkins inequality to get this bound. So this is just telling you that given N trajectories for each state, you, in order for you to get such an as accurate estimation, you have this sample complexity, right? So this is just showing that, you know, if you have n trajectories, then the probability of that 
you know, the deviation greater than epsilon is just upper bounded by some exponential function that decays with respect to epsilon squared, right? And also depending on like some other quantities here. But here, what I'm trying to say is, is just very expensive because you have to find a lot of trajectory, you have to accumulate a lot of trajectories for each state. And in practice, this is very expensive to do. First of all, you don't control which states you can observe, right? So sometimes you would focus, you would stack on a subset of the state, but not the other subset of states. So then your learning would be kind of um, uneven, right? So you would learn the values, value functions for this state, but not other states. Also, um, it's just, in general, it's just very expensive to do, right? So, Also, I wanted to introduce some very important concept about, about the on policy and off policy. So in a lot of scenarios, if you think about Monte Carlo methods, usually it's gonna be on policy, right? So it's like the environment would inter react to a policy mu, and this mu is just some kind of behavior policy. It's actually what the, um, you know, the, the, the agent is implementing. Right? So you would actually evaluate the mu using kind of maybe Monte Carlo methods, and then you would improve it by doing some kind of argmax thing. Um, so this is the own policy. It only have like a behavior policy that it implements and it actually evaluated and try to improve this behavior policy. Whereas the uh, policy evaluation is a little bit different. It has two policies. It has a behavior policy and a target policy. And sometimes this you know, agent doesn't even have to do a behavior policy. It could just get some kind of data that's already there. So, but nonetheless, let's just say like, you know, that agent has a behavior policy and using the behavior policy, it could accumulate some kind of observations or trajectories or history, right? So it's gonna be like triples of these SAR thing. Right from t to t, from t from one to t. So, however, the goal now is using this behavior policy. I wanted to evaluate another policy that is called my target policy pi, and the pi is usually different from mu. Right, usually the mu is some kind of more uniform exploration, whereas the pi could be some kind of optimal policy that I try to uh, understand or I try to learn. Right, so, so this kind of off policy evaluation might be partially addressing, you know, the kind of exploration and exploitation dilemma we talked about earlier. Why? You know, I might be using some kind of exploring policy, like, you know, behavior policy mu, which is kind of like doing kind of random exploration. But if I'm able to use my random exploration to evaluate an optimal policy pi, or like a greedy policy pi, then you know I, I might get around partially with this exploration exploitation dilemma, right? So that's why people have introduced this kind of off policy um, methods. But one thing I wanted to mention is that off policy methods, although sample efficient, but it's more computationally costly sometimes, and you know it could be very large. The evaluation could be very large variance. It could have a lot of variance and so on. So of course, you know, it's not like the off policy uh, methods are always better than on policy. There is a trade-off between the two, okay? So I guess, you know, um, finally, I just wanted to mention that this is, you know, for this lecture, the most important thing I wanted to say is that the difference between these two value functions, the state value function and the state action value function, and the relationship between them through this policy pi, right? And also the Bellman equation for a policy pi and for optimal 
uh, value functions, the Bellman equation is very important. Is a recursion kind of recursive relationship between the uh, value functions. And lastly, I wanted to mention that you know it is worth understanding the difference between on policy and off policy. So next lecture we will be talking about the um, you know the temporal difference methods. So hopefully you guys can take a look at the slides before uh, the lecture. Not tomorrow, I mean Thursday. <laughs> okay, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.